Welcome back to the channel guys, hope you are well today. We're going to be looking at the MSI X670E a carbon Wi-Fi. Now it's been a while since I have done a motherboard review, but the positive thing today is that a lot of the components that one would test on a motherboard I've already tested and that's things like the 7900X3D, the Crucial P5 and P3+, the 7600, the Velox Airflow, the Gil Polaris, the 7600X and also all the audio processing that I've done on all the Rode products that I've looked at. When looking to review a motherboard or even purchase a motherboard, the principles remain static in that there are certain things that we have to look at. Those are things like the socket or chipset being a X670, being a Z790 to make sure the CPU is compatible. Obviously, the generation of the components is a PCIe 4, PCIe 5, PCIe 3, and so on and so forth, as well as DDR4, DDR5. VRM is also important because if you are going for a more powerful CPU, you are going to want the motherboard to be able to complement the power draw or potential power draw of that CPU. The actual performance of the components being the most important for me because when buying a motherboard you have to know okay is it going to be able to get the best out of the components that I'm putting in and that's one of the most important things that we have to look at when buying a motherboard which is why all the previous data is really cool as well as the last thing looks how good does it look and does this kind of fit in with what you are wanting to go for. Starting off with the design the thing that I liked about it is its tininess and its ease to use so most motherboards are pretty much set up in the same way you can't get really innovative with that but something that I really like which is funny is that the bottom right on the chipsets or chipset heatsink was that there was no ARGB which is awesome because the meaty graphics cards that we have nowadays are always covering that anyway and I honestly don't see the point in why all manufacturers keep on trying to put RGB down there but I digress. However there's nothing about the design that screams to me new or innovative it's the same thing a generation on with a bolder front that is supposed to make it more aesthetically pleasing. Now to try and be fair to MSI as well as other motherboard manufacturers they have tried to innovate where they can and these are things like MSI steel armor as well as surface mount technology or SMT which makes the board look a little bit more presentable and on this particular board they have a thermal pads for the MOSFETs. Now to keep all bases covered the thermal efficiency is pretty good we do have a large IO heatsink as well as the Southbridge heatsinks for the chipset pretty much all over we've got a good thermal efficiency and I never noted anything that was above norm but I didn't see that to be a problem or I didn't expect that to be a problem but this is just something that I want to note is that every single generation of motherboard that we go through all of these components just seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger and we see less of the motherboard which is a good thing because obviously thermal efficiency is extremely important but this is just something that I want you to keep at the back of your mind for the conclusion. One of the key features that MSI is advertising is the DIY friendliness of the motherboard in that if you're doing water cooling this is where the connectors are if you're doing air cooling this is where the connectors are and that makes cable management a lot more friendly but other than that this is pretty much the only new innovative thing that I can see on this motherboard. Lastly the DIMMs are not reinforced which we do see in the PCIe lanes and we have seen a lot of motherboard manufacturers actually reinforcing the DIMMs however these are not and I don't have an issue with that but that is because if you are careful enough you really have to put a lot of stress onto the DIMMs to be able to actually be able to rip that out and your actual PCB on your RAM is going to break far quicker than the actual DIMM solder is going to come off however I do want to note that they aren't reinforced again for when we get to our conclusion. Now let's look at the specs. Onto the specs for the MSI MPG X670E carbon Wi-Fi. The chipset obviously is the X670 chipset or AMD X670. It supports AM5 in the socket set and goes all the way up to Ryzen 9. For memory it's best to use dual channel supports or dual DIMMs and you can get up to 6600 but you can actually push past that depending on the actual sets that you get. It does have AMD Expo support as well as XMP. For the onboard graphics, it has HDMI 2.1 with a maximum resolution of 4K at 120Hz. This is if you're not using your graphics card for output. It does have DisplayPort in DisplayPort 1.4, which is also 4K, but at 60Hz. And it has a Type-C display, which is 4K at 120. For the expansion slots, it has a 3 PCIe X16 slot. But if you need to know the specifics of this, you can just land on this page or just read and pause here. Storage, it has 
four M.2 slots and two of them will be PCIe 5 which come from the CPU source and the others are on Southbridge or on the chipset which are 4.0. For the USBs we're going to do frontal first because we're going to see a graphic for the rear but it does support four USB 2.0 in the front as well as four USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A's and lastly it has USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type C for the frontal as well. For land it has the Realtek RTL 8125BG which is a 2.5 gigabits per second LAN port. For wireless and Bluetooth it has AMD Wi-Fi 6E as well as supporting Bluetooth up to version 5.3. For audio it has the Realtek ALC 4080 codec which is pretty standard on your X670 boards across the range and this can support a 7.1 channel USB performance audio. It also supports digital or SPDIF output. For the internal I.O., it's got all the connections that you could possibly want, but to show you what AMD's done on the actual build or how they've set it out, I'm going to show you how they've done this in order to accommodate for different types of setups. The LED features, it's got the easy bag LED as well as the indicator on the top right, so you will be able to see either through light indications or through the little type of interface so that tells you the different code. Back panel ports, it does have the clear CMOS button, which is very advantageous, especially with DDR5 when you are trying to program your RAM and you need something without having to take your CMOS button out again and again and again you are able to flash the BIOS with the machine being in standby mode, basically just have it plugged in with a kettle plug and then plug in the USB into the specific USB slot, which should be the USB slot labeled number 10. And then from there, you're able to flash a BIOS again with the machine being off. Then you'll be able to go through all the different connectors going all the way through to 12 and 13, which is the Wi-Fi antenna, as well as the SPDIF or digital out. Inside the box, you will get the motherboard, the Wi-Fi antenna, a USB drive with all the drivers that were up to date at the time of release. You do have some of the easy M.2 clips, which are really cool because it avoids you having to screw and unscrew your NVMEs the whole time two SATA cables, you do have a 1 to 2 RGB LED extension wire cable which allows you to basically split your RGB. You do have a rainbow RGB LED extension kit, there are some cable stickers if you do want to label, as well as your quick installation guide and if you really need your European notice on regulatories. Now what I meant by the setup that MSI has done, they have set up the motherboard of the placement of the headers for easy installation. You can see here with the water cooling and system cooling, but you'll be able to go here for CPU cooler and you can see where the header is for water block cooler and where the header is for the top system fan where the headers are at the top there for frontal at the bottom on the bottom left and bottom right there and then for rear system fan just so that you can have nice clean cable management. If you do want this also a EKWB custom block I bet you will need to buy that as an aftermarket. If it hasn't been covered already it does have an 18 plus 2 plus 1 on the rails which is a duet rail power system which is more than sufficient to be able to power up to Ryzen 9. Now a couple of points that I do want to highlight is the LAN is a 2.5G again important for the conclusion and there is no Thunderbolt and the USB-C for frontal is a Gen 2 X1 at 10 gigabits per second. Now if we look at the Velox which is a review that I've done that had a Gen 2 X2 so if you're using this motherboard like I am with the Velox you're not going to be able to get that 2x2. Something else that I have noted is that this did not have a toolkit which I did note in the x570 series range as well as the Z690 series from MSI where they would have the flats as well as the Phillips screws but this didn't come with a toolkit, which was a little bit disappointing. Now performance, I'm not gonna go over. I will put links to the videos in which you can see the performance on how the VRMs work, as well as what the read write speeds, but I will tell you if you don't wanna go to those videos and you can take me on face value, the performance is pretty good. We pretty much got exactly what we wanted out of the CPUs, out of the PCIe lanes, as well as the RAM. We are able to expo, we are able to XMP, everything pretty solid on the performance. I do think that the VRMs are lacking. This is an 18 plus 2 plus 1 as mentioned, but they do have the new scope for the Ace MEG and then above that the Godlike in which we'd see maybe better results coming out of programs like Cinebench as well as Geekbench. But one thing that does need pointing out is that I have seen better power phasing on what you would call cheaper or more cost-effective motherboards. 
So to conclude, I'm going to conclude with a little bit of a joke that I had with a CPU manufacturer. And it was along the lines that a couple of years ago, I was so scared of bending a pin in a CPU on PGA pin grid array because it was so expensive to replace the CPU and the motherboard was cheap to replace. But now that the CPU manufacturer has gone land grid array, it's a little bit of a funny situation because it's more expensive to replace your motherboard nowadays than it is to replace your CPU. And this is something that J's Two Cents or J2Cents covered in a video. Now I've been doing this video for a while now and he covered it up four days ago, four days ago for me. And he went through generational leaps in pricing and it's something that has been noted by a lot of reviewers in that the pricing is extremely high for motherboards nowadays. This is not just MSI, this is motherboard manufacturers across the world. Now let's go on to the price. This retails for 12 to 13,000 Rand. Now this is in line with other segments of other motherboard manufacturers, but for this price, I personally would have liked to have seen 10G LAN. I would have liked to have seen Gen 2 X2. I would have liked the toolkit back. Put the toolkit back. Now that is because these are things that I personally want because I run a 10G home network. I'm constantly transporting data to and from my studio, but these are not things that you might necessarily not need or might necessarily not need. And that's again the point. Motherboards nowadays are being filled with features and benefits that you may not need. So it's much better for us to go from a carbon maybe to a MSI X670A Pro. And I actually did the 7600X on that test bench and that performed relatively well. Yes, it may not get the exact same performance for the CPU as the Carbon, but it's good enough to warrant the difference in price from 13,000 Rand down to five. So for an extra 7,000 Rand, are you really getting that much value for money? Honestly, I would go for that type of motherboard and then just expand on the PCIe slots to get the type of features and benefits that I want from a motherboard. As a final conclusion, I would like to see the prices of a motherboard drop. Now, as Jay rightly pointed out, it's not like the licensing fees have gone up on chipsets. It's not like the raw components have gone up that drastically. Yes, we did have a COVID hangover, silicone prices are all over the place, copper prices are all over the place, but that seemed to have settled down. So why are the prices still here? Now, this is becoming a problem with barrier to entry for a lot of new gamers, as well as people that want to upgrade. So this is something that I hope the manufacturers are watching because it is a problem in the industry. And if it is the call it added features and benefits, maybe some of these can be taken away. And I am speaking generally because maybe some people do need all the features and benefits that are being offered by these motherboards. However, there could be a new opportunity for motherboards in which you can kind of get a base carbon and then you can kind of spec it out to have 10G LAN and so on and so forth. However, the practicality behind that is maybe a little bit impossible. But these are just my thoughts. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this review. I do know that it was all over the place. It's just that it was a lot of information to get out to combine both the review as well as my general thoughts on the mobile scene. I do thank MSI for sending me this motherboard to review. And guys, I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Cheers and goodbye.